Ladies and gentlemen of the Shred Gaming Citicom video, we're going to be discussing a recent interview that Mark Cerny has given the official PlayStation magazine, and we're going to be doing some analysis on this, because obviously it is Mark Cerny, and he is the godfather of the PlayStation 4. Well, perhaps father would be a more appropriate term rather than godfather. Regardless, we are quibbling. Mark Cerny, of course, has been discussing the technology behind it, and his decisions behind some of the incorporated uh, components and so we're not going to be discussing all of it because some of it is not really pertinent to us and obviously if you guys want to check out the official thing then you by you know by all means can uh, but um, we're going to be discussing the actual process of other parts of this and doing some in-depth analysis so first of all uh, we're going to be discussing a little bit more on the processor. So Leon Hurley, who was the interviewer, asked uh, in your keynote, you mentioned personally researching the x86 processor. Processor, I'm sorry. When did that begin? And was it the origin of the PS4? Mark replied, I and a number of others, particularly Sony's internal technologist team, were involved from summer 07 and in the sense of doing a post-mortem on the PS3. Actual work on the PS4 didn't start until 2008. So out of quote just for a moment, many of you will know that Mark had a fascination with the x86. He believed that it was the right way to go. And Mark had replied uh, when he was asked you know, further about this, I wasn't deciding whether the x86 would be the chip, I was trying to work out whether or not it would be an option. If your only option is PowerPC, it's very restrictive in terms of hardware vendors. If you can use x86, you can talk to anyone out there who makes technology. He also added to this, because of its very long history, the x86 is rather complex. You can run code today that was written on the original chip in 1976. They just kept adding things to it over 30 plus years. If you read an x86 manual, it takes pages to explain the different ways you can move data from one register to another. Out of quote just for a moment, these are very, very tiny memory locations that are directly on the CPU and they're held to just uh, hold just tiny little instructions. They're a lot faster than cache, but they're also far, slow, uh, far smaller, uh, out, uh, back into quote, uh, from one register to the other. Based on all the additions to the architecture over the years, it's been a bit overwhelming from that perspective. Also, it gets very technical. It's a CISC architecture rather than a RISC architecture. I'll get into that in just a moment. There were definitely a first party voice that said x86 probably couldn't be used in games. So what the hell is a complex instruction set computing, also known as CISC, that's C-I-S-C. So complex instruction set computing is versus its mortal enemy, no, just kidding reduced instruction set computing are basically just embedded instruction sets on the processors um, and they can be a very good thing reduced instruction set processors are typically used for things such as arm uh, processors for example with cell phones and so on uh, however you also get high-end risk as well uh, these can also be things such as the power architecture um, and much more so anyway back into it the first real interaction we had with the games team was talking to first party um, about the x86 and explaining we felt it was usable in the console. We made 15 separate presentations. We went through from morning to mid-afternoon going through how we felt the time had come. We knew we needed to show our dedication and concern was just as high of the game teams. The presentation we did was so long that one of the teams was stranded on the tarmac for five hours and they still arrived before we finished going through all the materials we had prepared. Now, I'll quote of course, now there is actually a hell of a lot of reasons that x86-64 is starting to be pushed forward. Um, and to be honest with you, it's probably something that we can actually do an entire video on because it's an extremely complicated subject. But just to summarize several reasons for it in this particular video, x86-64 wasn't exactly fantastic extensions on ARM. Um, the power PC architecture, it's becoming more expensive, especially when you start taking into account things such as... Oh, let's go with the PC development. 
uh, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to simply say to developers, hey, you're familiar with that PC architecture. That means you can just simply move on to our systems. It also means that, as Mark said, you're much much more efficiently able to shop around for hardware vendors and because we know that they wanted an APU approach it does make sense. So these two questions in particular are very interesting. They asked what is your you know what were you most proud of in terms of the technology what do you think is going to have the most immediate impact if you will and Mark replied accessibility we have 140 titles in development right now because it's very easy to make games for the system in that respect um, things are pretty much how they were in the PS1 days. Then over the last next few years, the programs get a chance to dig deeper. You'll see improvements in graphics and simulations in the PS4. Secrets are unlocked. That will happen because we did expensive customizations of the GPU inside the PS4. He clarified on that and he said it's because the architecture is fixed. Like any console, developers get a chance to get very familiar in the way they wouldn't with some PCs. We will... S well, we'll see that just how you would with previous generations, you will see improvements made in the GPU areas of the asynchronous fine grained compute. And they also asked um, when were you first discussed the PS4 with the developers? What your surprising piece of feedback you received? And Mark replied that the most surprising thing I got was they wanted unified memory. I had not expected that to be the number one request from the developers. Even the PS2 didn't have unified memory. If you go back that far, and then it was asked, well, what's the benefits of this in speed and development? It's flexible. The way it works on the PS3 is you have the graphical assets go in one pool and the, me or the memory, and then the programmable assets tend to go in the other. The memory is divided equally, so your graphics as assets might not be half of what you have. So generally, when you're using memory that isn't unified like that, you tend to have to, to do a lot of shuffling between the two pools to make the game work. Now, this is something, of course, that's going into unified memory access. And to be fair to uh, the PlayStation 4, in terms of many different ways, it also supports uh, levels of humor, which is, uh, of course, heterogeneous uniform memory access, which is a little bit different to unified uh, memory access. Unified memory access is, as I'm sure regular viewers will know by now, but I'm just going to go into it uh, in case you're uh, unfamiliar. Unified memory access is a pretty simple um, philosophy. You have one pool of memory. It doesn't um, it doesn't matter what size that is. It can be 100 megabytes. It could be 800 megabytes. It could be 8 gigs. It doesn't matter. In the case of the PS4, however, it's 8 gigs. Now, you could do whatever you want with that memory pool. Now, of course, the PS4 does have some memory reserved for system. It's actually, as far as what we understand it right now, a about two and a half to three gigs it does have some dynamic uh, ram in there but that's just to make it easier for ourselves let's just say that it has five gigs of memory usable for developers it just makes it a nice round figure don't you agree so that means of course half of five gigs would be 2500 so 2.5 gigs so developers can do something if they so desire to say well we're going to put two and a half gigs of data for the graphics, two and a half gigs of data for the CPU. Oh, sorry, for the GPU and two and a half gigs for the CPU. That makes sense, right? But games are not necessarily like that. Now, the thing is, the PS4 and the Xbox One um, both have one thing in complete common. They can read from the same memory pool, the same chunk of memory. The difference is that that memory is split up. Think of it like a fence. So think of five gigs and then just, you know, draw an imaginary container in your mind and then literally split that container with a fence in the middle, like a line. Now you can move that line however you want. In other words, you can allocate the resources. If you want to have 100 megabytes of graphic access, uh, graphic assets, I'm sorry, you can. If you want to have 100 uh, megabytes of game resources and the rest of the 4.9 gigs is graphics, you can. It's a slider. However, humor is different to really simplify it, there is no slider, there is no division. 
the data is there. You don't need to copy from one memory pool to the other. It's all completely accessible by the CPU and the GPU. So that's the difference between unified memory access, where you've got that divider, where you have two separate memory pools, even though they're accessing the same pool of RAM, they have the memory pool, they have like a divider in between them to say, this is CPU data, this is GPU data, even though they're accessing the same amount of data, sorry, the same memory pool, but the difference is you say to the CPU and the GPU, okay, this is what you've got to separate them. Humor, it's not like that. With humor, you can access anything. So the CPU can read to something that's allocated to the, to the GPU because there is no allocation. In other words, the CPU says, okay, the GPU needs to access this, and then the GPU accesses that data. It then processes that data. It no longer has to copy to a separate piece of memory, to a separate memory location for the CPU or the GPU to copy it. So hopefully you've understood that. If you're not, I've explained it far better and done diagrams and various other bits and pieces in um, some humor videos. So you can actually search for that on the channel. That would be H-U-M-A and you would have a ton of information. This gives many different benefits, including the ability to just quickly optimize the code and to be able to get something working a hell of a lot faster. So anyway, um, moving on to something a little bit different. Initially building the PS4, or indeed any console, I presume there's a load of circuits and other bits on the table. What forms the box? Mark replied, what you're doing is designing a very large custom chipboard, in our case, two. The process is almost like writing a program. Chips are compiled these days. After several years of doing that, you finally get a custom chip back from the foundry, and then you build the prototype hardware that looks like anything. If you can... It can look like a PC, and it can also look like a lunchbox on your desk. However, he did add that the first prototypes tend to be larger, so the form factor isn't that important. So the hardware team may have a massive board with some chips plugged into it, but by the time any developer sees it, it's nothing like that at all. Now, he was also asked, what's the most important thing a casual gamer should know about the PlayStation 4? Mark Cerny, I'm pretty sure he had a troll face right over his head right then, but he said, and I quote, the most, power the most important thing is that it's the most powerful games console ever created. And then he was asked about the, the life cycle. In other words, how long do you expect the console to be at the forefront of Sony? In other words, the, the face of Sony. And he said that the PS4's life cycle would be pretty much like the PS3's life cycle. Now this is contrary, my add, to what a lot of developers have said they want. Many developers have stated that they actually want the reverse, they want shorter life cycles on consoles. Because as great as these specifications are for the PS4, I'm not knocking the specifications now, obviously compared to like a very high-end PC and all, but still, as a console, it's a very powerful system. But, here's the thing, so with the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, now in retrospect, retrospectively we could have said, well, the PS3, you know, they should have done something different with the memory, they should have maybe added more memory to both consoles, though, to be fair. Uh, even on their launch, I didn't really think it was enough, but that's, you know, my personal opinion, of course. But, the thing is, the CPU and the GPU on launch were very powerful, they were good, you know, they were reasonable. The problem is five, four, five, six, seven years and a hell of a lot changes. Just think of it this way, it's gonna be like 2020. So you can imagine that the level of technical power that we're gonna have. Developers are no doubt gonna be finding that the system is of course holding them back then. On the other hand, one could argue that titles such as The Last of Us, for example, um, really has only just started to pretty much finish off the PS3. I mean, for a couple of years now we've said, okay, PS3 can't do any better. That's it, you know, Uncharted 2, game's over. Then Uncharted 3 comes out, and okay, it looks a little bit better, there's nothing more that can happen. And then you see something like, say, God of War, and then you think to yourself, okay, well what else could they really do? And then The Last of Us comes out, and I honestly don't know if they could do more than The Last of Us with PS3. I think it's pushing it to the max, and there were even a few issues with The Last of Us, such as frame rate. But still, it was a very impressive achievement. My point is that I don't know how happy developers are going to be for another seven years of the same architecture. On the other hand, from the perspective of PC gamers, 
and for Xbox One owners as well, it's always a really good thing because they're all in it together. In other words, it's all x86-64. That means a lot of the code, a lot of the GPU specifications, a lot of the code is completely and utterly, utterly customizational, uh, customizable. I'm sorry. I'm having one of those days beginning, aren't I? Um, this is. One of the things that's happened, I mean, even if you look at C, which of course is a program language, you've had many different iterations of C, for example, C to C++, um, and many different libraries have been added to C, but the reality is that a lot of code would simply would you know if you got if you teleported someone who'd never used a computer, who's a programmer back in say the mid 80s, all the way to now, they would be able to write code that worked on modern machines. It wouldn't necessarily be up to programming techniques of today. They would be behind the times. They wouldn't know the best ways to go about certain things to get the most performance out of it. But if someone had never done programming, they'd, you know, they'd been stuck on a desert island for 30 years or they'd been put in a teleporter and then you said, okay, I need you to write some code for me. You gave them the basic specifications. They would be able to do so because of obviously the legacy. Um, so that means there is going to be a hell of a lot of different ways that they can improve things and the GPU as well of course would compute we know of course the PlayStation 4 has had numerous improvements including uh, not limited to the Q size improvements um, volatile bit improvements uh, extra bus uh, speed and various other bits and pieces as well as of course the GDDR5 memory I'm pretty, I'm pretty surprised actually Mark didn't mention that in this particular interview um, well, he mentioned unified memory, of course, but not the GDDR5 part. Regardless, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you found it at least somewhat interesting. I will see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.